Father, uh, we, as we approach you today, Lord, we ask that you would advance. Father, that you would advance, Lord, your revelation in our lives. Hallelujah. I want you to just pause there. Think about that. Think about how much you don't know. Think about the mysterious things. Think about the four beasts before the throne day and night. Think about uh, all of the mystical aspects of the kingdom that we do not understand, the seven spirits of God. We talk about the Holy Spirit, but it says the seven spirits of God, they're burned like lamps before the throne. Father, we don't understand. We don't know. What are the watchers? Lord, what does it mean to be an archangel? How is an archangel different from a seraphim and a cherubim? What is their function? God, reveal to us more today, we pray in Jesus' name. You know, one of the great problems that we have is once we've gotten into the community that is the church and we've been around church for a while and we can fit in a service and not feel awkward, you know, we, we start to think, oh, I, I'm getting the hang of this. I'm getting to know how this works. But it's kind of like technology, right? You know, years ago, that older generation, we got into email and the WWW, the World Wide Web, and we thought, we are with it. We got, but then, you know, it just morphed into this, and then the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing, and before long, we're like, eh, I need a 15-year-old. To do some things for me. The progression of spiritual revelation is greater than the progression of natural revelation. The knowledge, the things that can be known of God are way beyond the things that can be known about the creation that he created with his words. Right? The creator is greater than the creation infinitely more sophisticated and complex with systems that are native to who he is beyond our comprehension. And uh, so we, not, we have to become acclimatized to the idea that learning, growing, increased revelation should never stop. And when you get to the point where you think, you know, I, I, got, I got a handle on this, you will be left behind. You, you will be... That older person that you, you scoffed at when you were in your 20s thinking, what, you can't even check your email? It's so simple. TikTok, yeah. <laughs> Did you say that? Did, were you watching the feed? Did you watch the TikTok part? You hear that, guys? Those of you that were there, those words constituted a significant part of our day yesterday. I think it was prophetically a word came out and the band began to sing TikTok. Isn't that powerful? He wasn't there, but he just, he caught the nuance of Revelation. This is what, this is what we were talking about yesterday, about moving into something. And uh, anyway, Wow. Praise God. Spirit of revelation in the room. Hallelujah. Now, this is what I want to talk about. It's all about sight. And if you were around yesterday at the, uh, when I summed up the, closed the, the, the gathering, I talked about some of these things, but I'm going to talk about them again. And in more depth. Uh, but it's all about sight. What do you see? It's all about sight. The eye often launches into that prophetic Refrain, do you see what I see? Because this is, this is the desire of heaven. God didn't just save you so that you could go to heaven later. He saved you to be a participant and an agent for the extension of an invisible kingdom. But you can't expend, extend what you don't understand and what you can't see. You can't go beyond what you see and what you presently understand. So there's a constant invitation to step into the unknown. But, you know, it's awkward to do something for the first time. You're generally going to do it poorly. 
And we get to this place in our lives, especially as you get older, where there's so many things that you do well because you've been doing them for a long time. You start narrowing your focus on those things that you only do well. And spiritually, it's the same thing. And uh, you lose that need to, to conquer new realms. But I'm telling you, when the, for the kingdom of God, we must not lose the hunger to conquer new realms. Right, Brian? Hallelujah. So glad Brian's here today. Now, there's, I, and I've said this before, but, you know, we don't understand revelation. See, uh, we, we, think, we think when God is revealing something, it cannot but be seen. Listen, we, we think that if God is the one, if he's the one that's revealing something to a prophet or a person, that they'll never miss it. That, 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 that the equation, what makes this seeable is the fact that God is revealing it. Let me tell you, that's only half the equation. The truth is God is making lots of things visible, but lots of people aren't seeing it, even though his full power is there pushing this revelation into the realm of the earth. Only a sliver of people get it. So we got to leave this notion behind that if God is revealing something, I will see it because I'm going to go through some scriptures and we're going to see that the polar opposite is the truth. God is always revealing things and the problem is we don't see it. <laughs> That's scary, eh? It's like, okay, well, we should have the fear of the Lord. God, give me eyes to see. That's what we're saying. God, give me eyes to see. I don't want to miss it. Give me eyes to see. You can advance in your capacity to see. That's what we're saying. So I referenced this before, but when God is introducing Jeremiah to this prophetic realm, he calls him as a young boy, young man, and he... Uh, he starts showing him things, but then he asks him a question. He says, what do you see? Well, obviously, what, what you're showing me. Not necessarily so. I wouldn't ask the question. <laughs> if, I, if I thought there was no way of you not getting it right, I wouldn't ask you what you see. And then when he says, oh, I see a boiling pot or whatever it is, there's several revelations, he says, you've seen well. What does that mean? That means there's a potential of not seeing well or at all. You know, we have this idea, we have this idea that election comes by supernatural origins alone. That, that when God calls somebody to be a prophet, that's it. They're a prophet and they're going to step into everything that God called them to. No, they have a potential to step into things are, that they're called to. And the calling is based on a disposition that's already there, yes, but it still has to be developed. One of the things that came up this week and... Uh, uh, Dick DeWart was talking about how Isaiah, the Lord is putting his finger on Isaiah 60, 61, 62 recently. And then he launched into this thing that, you know, I, have you ever noticed how much of Isaiah is riveting? You know, and it's just, I mean, among all the prophets, you know, if you're going to go and read a prophet, chances are you're not going to go read ne Nephaniah or Zephaniah or Nahum. You know, Haggai, well, there's a couple of verses in there that are really, ooh. But man, Isaiah. It's like, do you think all the prophets are in heaven thinking, man, I wish I had some of the revelation Isaiah had? I, I wish I could have had the chance to say those things. <laughs> what if they did? What if they did have a chance? What if. What if that revelation was possible in an increased way, but we make the most of it or don't make the most of it in our lives? What if that applied to all of us? I love going through the Psalms, and when I hit a Psalm that's like, ooh, this is so thick and gooey with revelation, life, anointing, I love this. Inevitably, I go and say, ah, Psalm of David. Psalms of David, man, they just stand head and shoulders above every bus. And all the other psalmists like, ah, I wish I had that poetic ability that, that David had. It wasn't poetic ability. He saw things. He heard things. He heard the Godhead talking and musing amongst themselves. I mean, God the Father is talking to the Son. And he hears it. It's like all the other prophets. Man, I wish I heard that. 
So lean in a little more. My point is this. And this is this is my premise this morning. There's more to be seen. There's more to be heard. And it's not just appointed for a small cross-section of people. Yeah, there are some people that have an unusual aptitude, but you don't know what goes into that aptitude. And you, you, we think it's, well, it's just God decided. Right? That's what we like to do. We, we hide behind that. Well, God decided. You know, and there's some ways that God does decide. He does give certain things, but it's always based on a criteria. Now you think, well, but yeah, I'm not called to be the eyes of the body. I'm called to be the, the feet. I'm called to be the hands. True, 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 true. All of that. But let me just put it up here for you. You ready? As many as our sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. Okay? As many as our sons of God. That means there's no, you, there's no opting out of this, uh, on this paradigm. There's no opting out on connecting to the Spirit. There's no opting out on worshiping in spirit and truth. There's no opting out on intercession and prayer. The, these things, being led by the Spirit, doing these things, encountering, engaging with the invisible realm is part of being a son and daughter of God. Yes, some people are going to tap into it seamlessly, easily. And th those people sometimes, as uh, we know, sometimes are less good at other things, right? <laughs> but it doesn't excuse us and liberate us from the need to hone that particular skill. Because hearing his voice and knowing his voice is essential to being a child of God. My sheep know my voice. And so... Uh, Let's lean into that a bit. Ezekiel, in Ezekiel, uh, I, I want, oh, here, let me take a step back. I want to give you a couple of instances where there's blindness, where people are not seeing, and where there's a potential of seeing. Okay? And these are the scriptures we're going to look at. So Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house, which has eyes to see, but does not see, and ears to hear, but it does not hear, for they are a rebellious house. Clearly, clearly the <laughs> ADD. <laughs> what noise? Uh, clearly, clearly the Lord is faulting, not himself. <laughs> right? The reason they don't see and don't hear is because they are a rebellious house. They are stiff-necked. They are, they are against me. They are stubborn. They are arrogant. They are prideful. And therefore, they are blind. Therefore, they are deaf. And, uh, and so, again, let me just say, we have been invited to hear more clearly and to see more accurately. That is the invitation, and it is God who gives us the ability to do that. But there's a journey to increase your capacity. Now, some might say, well, you know, yeah, but that's the Old Testament. You know, that's, that's not New Testament. Okay, then. <laughs> Matthew 13, verse 11 to 16. And he answered them, and he said, because it has been given it to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever who has, this, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, hearing you will not hear, and shall not understand, and seeing you shall not perceive. For the hearts of this people have and this is a key, grown dull, grown dull. That's an evolution. That's a change. That's a transition. That is a shift from a place of hearing to a place of not hearing, from a place of seeing to not seeing. This is not automatically foisted you upon, upon you for God, from God. This is the result of your condition, the result of our choices. So for... The hearts of this people have grown dull. The ears, hard of hearing, 
and their eyes have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Now, Who's he talking about? Well, he wasn't talking to believers, you say. He's talking to unbelievers. He's talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to them. And yet, here's the thing. Jesus was offering the Pharisees and the religious leaders an opportunity to see. And he says to them at one point, and this is, this is a, para, uh, a kingdom paradigm that's so important. He said, because you say you see, your sin remains. He said, listen, the what keeps you in your blindness is the assumption that you see already. You believe with all of your being that you see already more than anybody else. The, the, the Pharisees of that day were the, were the spiritual equivalent of Sheldon in Big Bang Theory. He, he, says, he says to his friends, he says, don't you think if I was wrong, I would know it? <laughs> in other words, I see so thoroughly and so completely, I would know if I was ever wrong. <laughs> the arrogance of that. So what the, what the Lord is saying is you are locked into not seeing and not hearing, not because there isn't more available for you, but you're clinging on to your blindness in pride. In other words, if you would humble yourself and begin to believe that maybe others around you see more and that you have a potential of seeing more, you will see more. That's the promise. Well, again, you know, we say, well, you know, he's saying this to hard-hearted, rebellious New Testament unbelievers. Okay, then. <laughs> Turn to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11 to 14. In here, the writer of Hebrews is rebuking the, the Hebrews because of their backsliddenness. So they, they have, they're stepping back. And, uh, and say, he says, listen, he's writing to them. He said, I'd like to talk to you about really powerful, wonderful things like the priesthood of Melchizedek. Great stuff there. Great revelation. Great insight. He said, but I can't talk to you about that. I just can't do it because you, you're, too, you're too dull. I remember that story. It was so funny because uh, it's always great when you see great men of God who are dull. <laughs> you know what I mean? It gives you a sense of, Okay, well, if he's not perfect, I don't have to be perfect. But I remember the, hearing the story of uh, Mike Bickle. Uh, anybody heard this story before? Bob Jones was sent to Mike Bickle. This was before the IHOP had started and all this. And he, he was sent to the prophet. Mike Bickle didn't even think he was a prophet. He thought he was a lunatic. I mean, he just thought he was absolutely bozo because nothing in his Christian framework at that time prepared him for this character that was Bob Jones. But he comes to him one day, and he's prophesying. He says, he says, yeah. He said, well, you know, you're going to do a lot for Israel. Do you love Israel? Well, no, not particularly. Do you, do you, well, you're going to be doing a lot for prayer. Do you, do, you, uh, do you love prayer? Well, no, not really. It's not my strength. <laughs> and he starts going down the list, all these things. He, and he says, he, he says well, uh, man, I knew you were going to be dull. I didn't know you were going to be this dull. But he gave him some amazing prophetic words about what was going to happen 10, 15, 25, 35 years later. And, and one of the prophecies, and you probably have all heard this, is I see, I see Chinese people standing in, uh, in rice fields watching you on unplugged TVs. Right? What, what is unplugged TVs? Well, they didn't have iPhones back then. They didn't have anything of that nature. So Bob Jones is like the prophet saying, wheels within wheels. Well, what is that? We would probably have a different description if we saw what Ezekiel saw. We would use something else in our world today that better represents wheel within wheel. But he didn't know it was a TV kind of thing with a screen, but he didn't know what it was because there was none around. But again, you know, here you got this New Testament apostle, this guy who's gonna is called to shape the earth, and he was dull. What am I saying that for? It's saying so that you don't have to feel bad. <laughs> you don't have to feel bad. You don't have to defend your integrity. You don't have to be offended. How dare you suggest that I don't see well? We all see in part. 
We all understand in part. And part of getting more is realizing you are limited. So here's what I'm going to say. Sight is progressive for us. All right? Sight is progressive. Now let me read this scripture because he says, listen, there's these great revelations uh, of whom, but I can't tell you, he says, of whom it is, I have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. Wow. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God and have come to need milk and not solid food. He said, listen, you've, you've, you've slidden back. Your previous condition was better. Now, this should not surprise us. If you look at your timeline, there's ups and down moments. There's, there's moments when there, there's very, a great deal of zeal and clarity and things you just know about, you just are, are firm about, and then you forget them. You forget them, and they become less clear to you. And so it changes the expression of your Christianity. Then, if you have ever had a point where God re, you come into a new place and those things become clear again, you realize, oh, that thing's clear. And again, we, we think we're just victims of providence. Oh, God is showing me this again. No, you are seeing this again. You had the option to see it all along. You had the option to hear it all along. But you are the one who is going Closer and further. I am the Lord. I change not. You, on the other hand, you're always changing. I haven't always understood some of these things. And I, I you know, as a, somebody with some prophetic gifts, I've had some understanding of that. But I didn't understand all of it. And I remember one time I was here in Edmonton. I was living in Vancouver, but I came here and I met Rick Joyner for the first time. And I was invited to spend three days with him. And so I made the most of that. I drove him around. We went to a radio interview. I took him shopping. We went out for lunches. It was, it was great. He was, it was the first time that I'd ever met somebody and talked to them where I felt I could talk about everything I understood. And not only did he understand what I was talking about, but he could add to it. It was, it was so refreshing for me. I thought, okay, I'm not a lunatic. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, uh, but anyway, so we started talking, and I, I wanted I wanted him to see my some of my writings because I I thought you know I mean I'm not getting a lot of support from the body of Christ here, <laughs> you know, and I was like uh, how off am I you know so I gave him one of my articles I'm really secretly hoping he'd love it. So he come back the next day. He said, "Well, you got the goods." He said, "But you can't write worth beans." <laughs> Thank, thank you for that, I think. <laughs> but he's, he, said to, he said to me, the secret to good writing is editing. Uh, the words of the Lord are pure words, purified seven times like uh, silver in the furnace of the earth. He said, he said I, I, I edit everything I, I do seven times. So, and I said, well, my problem, I try to edit. I, I, I read back all the time what I wrote. But when I reread it, I think, man, this is brilliant. I wouldn't change a word. <laughs> I, I just can't see anything worth changing. <laughs> I just I think this is absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> Listen, something happened. After being with him for those three days, after being just with him for those three days, I started writing the next week. And from then till this day, I cannot write anything without having to revise it every time I read it. Every time I read something, I, I can see what needs to be changed. Now, how did I get that? How, how did I get that clarity? It was not there, and then it was there. I didn't have it, then I had it. It was imparted. Listen, spiritual clarity is something that you can pick up by being around others who see more. And I've discovered that more and more times. That's why it's important who you hang around. You know, well, and again, I'm not saying never be around unsaved people or, you know, because you got to evangelize the rest of that. But, I mean, the people you're learning from and the people that you're gravitating towards to be the most influential in your life should be people who see more than you. 
Make the most of being around people who actually see more because you'll pick up what they see by osmosis. It's just going to land on you. It's going to grab you. I remember some of the most significant times I've had in ministry were right after being with really significant people. I remember a, a season I went and did a road trip to, uh, to Vancouver and Ladner. Uh, I can't remember where else I went. But uh, it was right after being at the John Wimber event here back in 1994 or something like that, uh, the, the holiness to the Lord. And everything, all of my gifts surged. I mean, I, I saw, I went into things that I'd never gone, gone into before. I saw things with a clarity I have never seen. It was just by being in that guy's meetings. Ah. You know, the enemy's trying to steal something from us. And I, even as I'm talking about this, I'm feeling the warfare over this because the enemy is trying to, to, to I mean, he, the Lord is trying to get us to be conscious of the results we're having as the church, but the enemy is trying to use that added emphasis to say, you going to meetings is not important. And we have a problem today in the church where we just have this idea that, that being at a meeting, well, you know, I already know most of what I know. It's just occasionally good to go to church just to, just to you know, See if I'm missing something. <laughs> I don't know what the motivation is, but we've become very lackadaisical about the gathering of the church, of being together. I'm telling you, when a fire is burning in a room and we get closer to those coals, we will ignite more. And I can tell you for sure, all backsliding is preceded by a diminishing appetite for being together with the body. Always, always, always. So watch out for that. Now, you know in the Old Testament, we're, how are we doing for time? We're doing good. In the Old Testament, there were times when, when uh, and you, you see this, where even Saul, who is not amongst the prophets, he happened to be in the company of the school of prophets. You remember what happened? Happened, I think, at least twice. Right? And he suddenly he's with the prophets. He's not a prophet. He's never prophesied before. But he gets around the prophets and boom, he gets swept up into the anointing that's there and he starts to prophesy. And the people start to fall among the prophets. What is that? That's impartation. That's, that's stepping in a, the, a clarity that somebody else has, and they have it in such abundance, it's spilling out all around them. And if you just get near to them, you step into the cloud of their visibility. That would be great, right? But, you know, if we feel like we see better than everybody else already, we have no need to get around others who see more. I, I'm telling you, this is a problem. It's a big problem, and I see it over and over. And it be, especially becomes a problem when you start to become functional in ministry. Some of the people that get stuck the quickest are the ones that start to become able to do a couple of things ministry-wise. As soon as you start to get into that sense that, oh, uh, when I pray for people, something happens. And I've been prophesying and I got asked to preach. All of a sudden, you stop trying to be around people who have more than you because now it's time for me to build my thing. Well, build your thing by being around people who have more. Yeah. Yeah. That's how it actually works. Uh, recently, I, I went somewhere and, and uh, somebody was talking about that because they were, they were astonished that I had paid a couple hundred dollars to go for a ticket, you know, airline ticket, to go somewhere for three days, not to do a meeting, not to get a paycheck, not to, not to do anything significant to advance my ministry, but just to go for lunch with a significant leader. I said, well, why would you do that? I said, because when I'm with people who have more than me, they align something inside of me. What they carry does something with me. And so I take every opportunity to be with them. I, I'll, just because you have a ministry and God speaks to you doesn't mean you don't need those, those ones. We absolutely need them. You need them more than ever. 
And so God is trying to inverse and reverse this mentality, this egotism of ministry and this idolatry of the pulpit that makes us think we're all of a sudden we're independent, we don't need anybody. No, we need people more than ever. So God wants to give us more. And again, these things are given. You can step into them. You can receive them. They can be there or not there and all of a sudden there. 2 Kings 6, 16 and 17 is the time when the Syrians were surrounding Elisha. And I love this story because it's so, I think, how stupid can you be, you know, if you're the Syrian king, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, what's going on? Which one of you is spying for the king of, of Judah? Well, nobody's spying for the king of Judah. He has a prophet that hears what you say in your bedchamber. Well, that's kind of intrusive. <laughs> right? So I said, I know what we'll do. We'll sneak up on him. <laughs> yeah, that'll work. So... <laughs> There they are. The Syrian army is surrounding him. And, of course, his servant is, is afraid. He's, he's freaked out. And, uh, and in verse 16, Elisha says to him, so he answered, Do not fear. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened his, the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Wow. He didn't see and then he saw. He didn't see, then he saw. He didn't see, then he saw. God wants to give you vision. He wants to clarify. He wants to take you out of dullness. And he wants to put his finger on the things that contribute to your dullness. And he might be saying, hey, you need to stop doing some of these things because it's rendering you dull. But, you know, if you love it more than you love clarity, you're going to end up staying dull. And maybe even get a duller. Now, let me just throw a little something that this is exciting to me, especially given the weekend we just had. I love this because it says, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around. But they weren't just all around. They were all around Elisha. Isn't that interesting? They weren't around Israel. They were around Elisha. There's a word there. Listen, because part of what we're learning to do is the more that we see, the more that we engage with the invisible realm, the more we're empowered to engage that realm on our behalf. The reason why the armies of the Lord were around Elisha is because Elisha could see and he was engaging with that angelic host constantly. This is a part of God's strategy going forward. A people that have eyes to see, that know how to worship in spirit and in truth will unconsciously, organically release the resources of heaven as they interact with the invisible realm. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, again, it's easy for us to think, well, yeah, the, 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 but this is for the elite Christians. I'm just a, you know, I'm just a helpless ministry. I'm just a, you know, average intercessor. I'm just a, no, you, if, you can be if you want, I suppose. <laughs> but God is not limiting you to being an average Christian. Average Christianity is for those who choose average Christianity. This is what it says in 2 Corinthians, Corinthians 4. Paul is at, he's, he's exhorting the believers, and he says, I'm going to read a large section of Scripture, but there's a lot in it here. He says, Therefore we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, 
While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, and the things which are not seen are eternal. He's saying, listen, what will enable you to fight the fight, what will enable you to be a part of an overcoming company that releases heaven on earth is a focus, a fixation on the invisible. This shifting from looking at the world around us to looking higher is a part of the ascension, the call into clarity that we are invited to experience. Wow. Now, it's interesting. I'll read the whole thing because it's so good. This is one of those juicy portions. Juicy fruit, juicy for we know that if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God. See, even that conviction is a growing conviction. Uh, you may be sitting here today and you're like, well, you know, God is kind of vague to me. The spiritual things are kind of vague to me. I mean, I, I kind of know that heaven's there and I'm going to go there. But, you know, we're in worship and people are saying, I feel this and I say, see that. I'm not sure if it's even true. Because I don't, I don't experience any of that. But you can. Here's it, you can. You can, you can, you can, you can. Yeah, but I've been trying. Okay, yeah, it's God's fault. (laughs) Lean in more. Lean in more. Stop saying no, it's not possible. Yes, there are things that others just seem to go into and you think, I want it to be that easy. There's a lot of things others do that I think, I want that to be that easy. And, you know, it's not that I can't do it, I just usually won't. (laughs) Because we like to do what we're good at. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan. Who is in this tent? Anybody in a tent? What's he talking about? What's he talking about, Brian? He's talking about your body, this tent. He's saying, listen, we're, there's another habitation the internal, but he says in, there's something inside us that's groaning to be there. I just said this on the weekend I, to all the leaders there. I said, I said, how many of you groan? About half the room put up their hands. He said, no, no, no. We all groan. We all groan. Just not all of us know we groan. What is a groan? Uh, Romans 8. I, I can't teach on this right now, but let me tell you, there, there, are, there are things at work inside of you, but dullness, dullness causes you not, to not be aware of the activity of the spirit realm. And what you're invited to is to get clarity on, the, on, the, on those things to, 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 to enhance your ability to experience them and know that they're there. But you have to start by humility. You have to start. Maybe some of us, it's like we're we're as bad as the Pharisees. And Jesus said, because you say you see, your your sin remains. What he's saying is, listen, if you stop believing that you see everything, if you stop believing that what others are saying they experience is probably fake, they're exaggerating, so they're, they're, they're dramatic people. If you stop assigning falsity to everything that is happening that's beyond you, that's the gate. That's the gate right there. I know it's scary because it's like, yeah, I feel so unqualified. Welcome to the club. Welcome to the club. I get around people and I think, man, I got nothing. <laughs> I'm serious about that. I, there, there are people that I get to walk with from time to time, and I think, man, they see so much. It's amazing. I remember we were in meetings, and uh, time and time again, uh, spiritual leaders that I was walking with, they would come up with revelation. They, we'd be in a room, and I can, you know, we are actually advancing as we're praying, we're seeking the Lord, and, uh, and I'm starting to get something. It's like, oh, I'm starting, I start, I, I'm starting to get a little bit of clarity. I, th- I think I see a leg. 
<laughs> or something vague like that, you know, something very nonspecific. And all of a sudden, the leader of this meeting, he starts giving this panoramic sense of what God is doing in the meeting and, and where we're going. And I thought, oh, I, I, I see my little one puzzle piece in the midst of the hundred he just shared. And I know I'd like to see like that. Man, he saw so quickly. How did, how did, how do you do that? How do you do that? It's not just by accident. You can have that. 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 Now we're not all going to be Bob Joneses, but you can have way more than you have. That the mean level, what it means to be a seeing Christian is changing generation after generation. And what you presently see right now as an average Christian is a hundred times greater than the generation that was alive a hundred years ago. You intuitively experience way, way, way more than any other generation of the church. It's just as compared to the people that are on the forefront of seeing and hearing that you feel like you don't. You see a lot. You hear a lot. Are you guys still with me? I'm going to turn because, because there's a very clear and obvious way forward. If, if the servant of Elisha was not seeing and the Lord granted him the ability to see, if New Testament believers in Hebrews were dull and they were being encouraged to move out of that dullness, it's saying it's all within the realm of reach. It's all within the realm of possibility. You don't have to disqualify yourself or excuse yourself. Now, I'm going to read a passage from Revelations from the church of Laodicea because here is Jesus talking prophetically to one of the seven churches of Asia. He's coming to visit them. These are people. These are Christians. These are early Christians. These are people that have had the pure apostolic gospel, right? I mean, there's no culture added to this other than the culture of their day. I mean, Jesus, you know, wasn't long ago that he was alive and on the earth, and the apostles clearly are still alive. But this is what he says to the church of Laodiceans. He says, these things say the amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Pretty harsh for uh, people that are trying to serve God, eh? Maybe the, maybe the bar is higher than we know. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. Hmm, that's interesting. Because, listen, you're in the condition you are because you believe something about yourself. What do you believe? Let's look at it again. Because you believe I am rich. I have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That's quite a contrast. Right? How can you be all those things and think you're the polar opposite? Listen, welcome to the modern world. Welcome to the modern world. This is the reality. When you look at the compartmentalization of the church, you have people who, who churches, streams that came out of revival at one point and still hold the belief systems of that revival, ergo, they believe that they are in, still in the midst of that revival. Only, you know, maybe not quite as much as we were experiencing 100 years ago, but we're still that. No, you're not. I mean, this is, this is not even, you know, 100 years. This is like a handful of years. I don't even know how long it was exactly, but John is still alive. And here's a church that was on the cutting edge, experiencing revival, the glory of God, the apostolic gospel, signs, wonders, and miracles. And Jesus is saying to them, you're not what you think you are. And we get offended when somebody tells us that today. Good grief. I would not be shocked. Uh, we should not be shocked. Right? 
And we, we like to think, well, others are more blind than us. And, and that may be, but, you know, <laughs> the guy who has 2060 vision might be, you know, vaunting himself or exalting himself over the guy who's completely blind, but he still has 2060 vision. I mean, he's got Mr. Magoo glasses. <laughs> if we're being invited to have 2020 vision, 2020 vision. You know, we may think, oh, I'm way ahead of the guy that's blind, but you're Mr. Magoo. You're almost blind. I don't want to be Mr. Magoo. I don't want to be somebody who's stuck in this place where because I see more than somebody else, I believe I don't need to see more. That's the arrogance that he's pointing out this church. He said, listen, you have things. I'm not denying you have things, but the things that you have have blinded to you to what you don't have. And what does Jesus say to them? What's the solution here? Yeah, this, this is a problem, clearly. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with ISAV that you may see. What is he inviting? He's saying, Christians, you've grown dull, you don't see, you can't hear clearly. It's not just the plight of the unsaved, it's not just rebellious Israel, it is the human condition that we are moving along an axiom of clarity and we're getting more clear and less clear depending on the attitudes of our heart and what we're willing to dispose, you know, to, to orient around and what we're willing to do or not do concerning our spiritual lives. But God is saying, listen, if you only knew the vision that you could have, if you only knew the clarity that you could have, if you only knew how much I want you to interact with the kingdom of heaven, if only you knew, understood what was available to you, you would give everything. So here's what I want to leave you with. We vacillate. We have moments of greater clarity and less clarity. And that, that's going to happen. Life is like that. You know, you start getting married and having six kids. You know, less time, three more. <laughs> that wasn't necessarily prophetic. <laughs> you know, life, this present life, this natural life does detract from our ability to give ourselves. And we, you know, you're going to a job. You're working alongside unsanctified people. You're, you're around cursing and ungodliness constantly. It will wear on you. It will diminish your ability to see more clearly, all the more reason to give more of your time outside of those environments to hone that, that vision. All the more reason to get around people who go deeper. All the more reason to humble ourselves and say, God, I want to I wanna get more sight. I want to give myself to what can, I want to salve. I want to be desperate. I want to see. I want to hear. God, I want your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. That is what's available for all of us. More of that if we want it. So in the words of uh, Kurt Friesen, I think I've made my point. <laughs> I was talking to Kurt. I said, Kurt, you should get a cell phone. You're very hard to get a hold of. He says, yeah, it might be time. I think I've made my point. <laughs> I thought that was so funny. <laughs> Hallelujah. There's more. There's never, we, we, as finite people serving an infinite God, at no given point is there less. There's always more. Infinite. You know, what is that song, that old hymn, you know, when we've been there 10,000 years, we've no less days to sing. That's the nature of eternity, 
and an eternal God. Endless revelation. So we thank God. Father, we thank you. Let's stand up together. Worship team, why don't you come? God, we thank you for the things you've given us. We thank you for the clarity that you brought our way. We thank you that you took us out of the miry clay. We thank you that you delivered us from demons. We thank you, Lord, that you have invited us to share, God, in, in the powers of the age to come. And, Father, whatever dis disappointments, whatever failures in our life, whatever ventures we've ventured on and not succeeded, we, we declare we still believe that there's more to be apprehended. We still believe as a people that there's more to be entered into. And Father, I declare for this church, Spruce Grove Community Church, that your best days are ahead of you. That there's more just over the hill. That there's more glory, more authority, more revival. That the worship we've experienced has been great. We are locking the door behind us and we're going forward, not backward. Hallelujah.